Listen now of a time long past when sorcery thrived and wild adventure was forever in the offing. Deadly sorcerer is called out of nightmare by a ruthless king driven into evil and a mystical sword is forged for a mighty warrior who rises out of legend to topple a kingdom. The sword and the sorcerer from the king's dungeons for one night with you. Uh, it's a slim bounty for such a task. Why is it bastard? determines the fate of an entire dynasty. Dungeons and dragons, serpents and splendor, wizards and witches, danger and desire. The mightiest of all heroes in the greatest of all adventures. The Sword and the Sorcerer. Welcome back to Geek Channel 8. I'm Eric. And I'm Johanna. I've started watching a TV show called The Last of Us, which is a zombie post-apocalyptic thriller drama set in Boston. So it's super happy, right? It's a real happy kind of show. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's fun just seeing something like this set in Boston, though. We never really get to see, you know, post-apocalypse anywhere other than like the desert or New York. So it's fun seeing a city closer to us. And it's actually something that my son is really into. So ask a 13 year old boy, Last of Us, it's great. Maybe that's in our future. Maybe a Last of Us is in our future. For those who don't know, we live in New England. Now we are doing a run of sword and sorcery films here in preparation for the release of the new Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves movie. I chose this movie in particular because this is one that almost every 12-year-old boy, which I was 12 when this came out, would probably have seen that was in the Dungeons and Dragons. Not because it was very successful at the box office. It was, but not for that reason. But because it was in heavy rotation on late night cable TV. (laughs) This and Excalibur, uh, whereas like a more successful film at the box office or more mainstream successful like Conan, they held off on the broadcast rights for a long time. This was just always on. (laughs) Let me give you a background to 1982 as far as movies go, because 81, 82, we've talked about 1982 before on this 
show how 1982 is an amazing year for film, especially genre film. But since nothing happens in a vacuum, we should talk about a little bit about the films that came out in 81 because it's a nice contrast also. So as far as genre movies in 81, uh, May 1st, Friday the 13th, part two came out. Uh, it was, of course, on a Friday the 13th because that's when those movies come out. <laughs> June 12th, Raiders of the Lost Ark. June 26th of the 81, For Your Eyes Only. July 10th, The Fox and the Hound and Escape from New York. July 24th, Wolfen. August 21st, An American Werewolf in London. So there was kind of a werewolf thing going on. <laughs> August 28th, Body Heat. October 2nd, Enter the Ninja. October 30th, of course, Halloween. Two, December 18th, Sharky's Machine and Ghost Story, and December 25th, Modern Problems. Kind of a mixed bag. There are a couple good ones in there, like Raiders, uh, but some sword and sorcery adjacent films. So I'm I'm saying adjacent because they're not all pure sword and sorcery, but some sword and sorcery, some high fantasy, some fairy tale, and maybe sword and sandal, uh, you know, historical February 12th, Quest for Fire. April 10th, Excalibur came out, which was the other one that I mentioned. June 12th, History of the World Part 1 and Clash of the Titans. Hmm. Both came out that same day. I mentioned History of the World Part 1 only because it has some sword and sandal spoof in it. June 26th, one that we probably should have done already on this show, Dragon Slayer. Hmm. And then... November 6th, Time Bandits. Ah, classic. So you can see toward the end of the year, it's getting a little bit better. Now, in 82 genre films, February 19th, Death Wish 2 and Swamp Thing. Uh, April 2nd, the remake of Cat People. Oh, yes. <laughs> There's a lot of sequels this year. May 21st, Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior. May 28th, Rocky 3. June 4th, Star Trek 2, The Wrath of Khan and Poltergeist on the same day. June 11th, E.T. the Extraterrestrial. June 13th, Firefox. June 25th, The Thing and Blade Runner on the same day. Wow. July 9th, Tron. August 13th, Friday the 13th, Part 3. A lot of part threes. September 24th, Amityville 2. October 22nd, Halloween 3. And First Blood on the same day. November 12th, Creep Show. December 8th, 48 Hours. And Sword and Sorcery adjacent films included March 11th, Ator the Fighting Eagle. May 14th, Conan the Barbarian. July 2nd, The Secret of Nim. And then August 16th, The Beastmaster. November 5th, Sorceress. November 19th, The Last Unicorn. And December 17th, The Dark Crystal. So you can see 82 like, bam, there's this major explosion of genre film going on. We've talked about it before. The Thing and Blade Runner being released on the same day. And within a month of each other, you get like, the third Rocky film, the second Road Warrior film, the second Star Trek film, Poltergeist, E.T., The Thing, Blade Runner, and then even like a little bit after that, Tron. So like all within, you know, the early part of that summer. 82 was an amazing time. <laughs> That's insane. A lot of the sources that I read about the explosion of these genre films came from is that it's all from Star Wars, that the success of Star Wars suddenly made it possible for projects like this to get greenlit that never would have been made before. Yeah. And since a film takes about three years to make and then add into that, like the pre, you know, trying to figure things out and get getting stuff greenlit and going through the pipeline, you know, about five years is what you would expect. And this is about five years out. I was really curious about where this film came from after watching it. And I did some research into the director, Albert Pyun, who 
was basically in charge of this project from start to finish. It was his brainchild. He was completely unaware about Conan the Barbarian being made right around the same time and wasn't afraid at all about this film landing in that film's shadow, you know, until much later. But I did some research because I had never heard of this director. But then when I looked into, you know, well, what else has he done? He's actually made like 40 films. It's crazy. And I had never heard of any of them. So I just wanted to rattle off a few titles where I saw the title and I was like, oh, God, I have to know what this is about. Film from 1991, Doll Man a science fiction action film based on the comic book about space cop Brick Bardo, also known as Dollman, who is only 13 inches tall. Bardo is equipped with his Kruger Blaster, which is the most powerful handgun in the universe. Yep. <laughs> so, Dollman. Um, and, and this, I mean, this guy just covered a full genre range. So, another of his most famous titles, most famous in quotes, 1993's Brain Smasher, a love story, a romantic comedy about a tough bouncer from Portland, Oregon, a glamorous supermodel who has everything except for true love, and her sister, Cammie, an Indiana Jones-style botanist in search of a very rare lotus flower, and they are all pursued by a gang of Shaolin monks who are emphatically described throughout the film as not ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> And then in 1996, we get Omega Doom, a sci-fi action film set in a dystopian future where a robot warrior plays both sides of a robot civil war in a small town during a nuclear winter. The film is mostly based on Yojimbo by Akira Kurosawa. That's one I think I have to see. <laughs> so we'll do some more of this. I promise you we will revisit this guy Anyone who grew up in the 80s is probably somewhat familiar with him, at least with his work, because that was the grand era of direct-to-video stuff to fill the blockbuster shelves, and he was one of the masters of that. Yes, almost all this stuff is direct-to-video. I think some of the only films that maybe were actually successful was 1989 cyberpunk film called Cyborg, starring Jean-Claude Van Damme. And Pyun also made the 1990 film version of Captain America, starring Max Salinger, which actually very closely follows the plot of the comic books. So if you wanted to do a compare and contrast between this Captain America and the new Marvel reboot, I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts on that. But I should have said, actually, Sword and the Sorcerer was very successful relative to its budget. It cost $4 million and grossed $39 million plus making it the most profitable indie film of 1982, unless you count First Blood as an independent film, which it sort of technically was because two studios passed on it before sending it to independent investors. I don't know if I count First Blood as an indie film, but either way, first or second. <laughs> I have a footnote to that, which is that Conan the Barbarian, which we also talked about, also made $39 million that year but cost $20 million. <laughs> So it made the same amount, you know, I think Conan the Barbarian made like a fraction of a million more, like a half million more or something, but cost five times as much to make. <laughs> Just throwing that out there as a little interesting note. The film is dedicated to stuntman Jack Tyree, who died performing a stunt for this film. There's a scene where someone jumps off an 80-foot cliff, and that is Jack Tyree, and he missed the landing cushion by about 60 centimeters and died performing the stunt. They kept the footage in the film to honor his sacrifice and dedicated the film to him. But it's one of those famous cases of stunt people falling in the line of duty. So RIP Jack Tyree. Okay, and I will say this episode we will dedicate to Albert Payan because he just passed away less than two months ago. So right toward the end of 2022, we're filming this in early 2023. So he hasn't really been gone for very long. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Some would say this movie is an epic turkey, <laughs> but it still has some awesome stuff stuffed inside. 
like an epic scene where a turkey leg is used as a weapon. Nice. I figured we needed an epic recipe for this. And while I try to make everything on this show, I have never attempted this and probably won't unless I'm having a big party with a bunch of people. But if you wanted to do this, if you wanted to steal this idea, you take this recipe, you have a big party and you show B movies at it. The turducken. No! (laughs) (laughs) I figure we hit this movie is going to end in a three way battle. So we may as well have a three way (laughs) recipe. A turducken, for those who don't know, is a chicken stuffed into a duck stuffed into a turkey. So this recipe I've got comes from SeriousEats.com. It's called The Ultimate Turducken Recipe by J. Kenji Lopez Alt. According to Serious Eats, the modern popularizing of the turducken has variously been attributed to either Paul Prudhomme, the Cajun chef, or Hebert's Specialty Meats, which is also a butcher shop based in Louisiana. So originates somewhere in the Louisiana area in the 1980s. But animal stuffed animal roasts go back to at least Roman times. Wow. And according to Serious Eats, I don't know if this is true, but they would sometimes have roasts that could use as many as two dozen different beasts of ever decreasing size. (laughs) (laughs) So you can only imagine what that must have been like. I'm trying to imagine those larger animals. Like, does that mean it's like a lion inside a rhino or? (laughs) Probably like a bull or something. Yeah. Prep time is about an hour. Cook time is three hours and 15 minutes because you cook it for a long time at a low temperature in order to cook all the way through all the different beasts. There's a rest time of about 20 minutes in here. So the total is going to take you about four hours and 35 minutes. And it serves 18 to 24 people. (laughs) Ingredients. Kosher salt and freshly ground black pepper. One small chicken, three and a half to four pounds. That's 1.6 to 1.8 kilograms. Two pounds, which is 907 grams of raw bulk sausage meat. Yes, it also has (laughs) sausage in it. (laughs) One duck. Four to four and a half pounds, which is 1.8 to 2 kilograms. Three tablespoons, that's 44 milliliters of vegetable oil. One turkey, 10 to 13 pounds, that's four and a half to 5.9 kilograms. Special equipment you'll need, butcher's twine, plastic wrap and or a vacuum sealer, large stock pot, large roasting pan with a V-rack, or a rimmed baking sheet with a wire rack. Here's the procedure. First, you bone the birds. For the birds, a knife is only used to remove the wishbone, slit the back, cut the joints at the wings and thighs, and scrape the meat from the leg bones. Everything else is done by hand, but the turkey should have its leg and wing bones left in so that it still looks like a turkey after it's been roasted. The complete instructions on deboning can be found at Serious Eats. Once you've deboned the birds, you realign the tenderloins by placing the tenderloins in the space between the breasts and the legs to create a more even layer of meat. Butterfly the breast. Simply butterfly the top of the breast and fold it toward the center to even up your meat. Season it evenly and liberally with salt and pepper on all sides. And then... For the stuffing, don't use bread or grain-based stuffing because it will cause it to collapse. You know, so what you want to do is use more meat, specifically (laughs) sausage. So that's what the sausage is for. You Bulk sage sausage is what they recommend at this site. The trick to even cooking is you stuff the chicken with sausage and you seal it in a cryovac bag or with butcher's twine. And you poach it in warm water until the very center of the stuffing is between 140 to 145 degrees Fahrenheit. For those who are on Celsius, you do, you figure it out, plug it in. I'm sure there's a translator online. Then immediately and rapidly stuff the still warm chicken inside the boned duck. 
Now, you want to fry the duck for about 15 minutes in a skillet to get that duck skin tender. This is kind of optional, but it comes out better if you do this way, supposedly. Then you repeat the process, cooking the duck end, that's the duck with the chicken inside it, until it <laughs> comes up to 140 to 145 degrees throughout. And then you put the duck in up in the turkey and seal with skewers. Truss the turkey and roast until the skin is golden brown and the turkey meat reaches 145 again, monitoring to ensure the duck and the chicken stay above 130. So the full recipe for this with breakdown, pictures, excellent, and all that can be found at SeriousEats.com. And if anyone does this, definitely write us and let us know about it. Because normally I do all the recipes on the show. This one I have never done, and I don't know if I ever will. But there you go. The epic chicken inside a duck inside of a turkey. The turducken, which I think is the perfect compliment to this turkey. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's one of my favorite things about this genre, actually, is the mag the scenes of magnificent feasts with, like, you know, so, so much meat. Just piles and piles of meat. I, and it's, yeah, it's a fitting recipe. Now that we have our turducken, let's get into this episode. This thing opens with... King Cromwell landing on Tomb Island, which sounds a little ominous. We'll get into that in a second. With a witch to revive the ancient sorcerer Zusha of Delos. As we learned from Tank last episode, never resurrect anything. <laughs> So this priestess, she resurrects Zusha for Cromwell, and she pays the price for doing that. Yep. <laughs> he, they want to know that he actually has the power. Never mind that he just came back from the dead, but they want to know that he has the power. He, like Richard Maul, who plays the sorcerer, rises up and he just like holds out his hand and like sucks the heart out of the witch and, and <laughs> crushes in his hand, despite the fact that she's his loyal follower rather than any of the other like red shirts that are there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a, an epic introduction to, to a sorcerer character. Cromwell convinces Zusha to aid him in his fight against King Richard, who apparently we find out is sort of the good guy King. One of the things I love about this film is that they are clearly stealing these names from English history. Like, you know, King Richard's the good guy and Cromwell is the bad guy. It's, you know, right off the bat, they're trying to draw us into historical palace intrigue in order to make us believe in the fake palace intrigue. Yeah, and I think some of the other European royalty is mentioned later on in it, too. So... This is one thing that would have driven Lovecraft batty. He hated that in the genre, people did this. He once wrote of Robert E. Howard, who wrote the Conan stuff, which he loved, that the one fatal flaw in it is that Howard used the names of real peoples and real cultures and real places. And that works if you're not familiar with those places. But Lovecraft was well read, so it just ruined it for him. Mm -hmm. And I'm on the edge of that with this movie, where I'm like, oh, really? Okay. I would have preferred that they went with... They could have gone with English history, but l more obscure than Cromwell and Richard. Like, those are big ones, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and nowhere related to each other in time. That's one of the other things I love about this. <laughs> so Cromwell double crosses and kills Zusha after he's helped him defeat Richard in like the battle just takes place seconds later. They've like already won and he kills Richard, kills his wife. And all this is witnessed by their son, the Prince Talon, who, of course, has the classic. No, <laughs> <laughs> then he escapes by using his triple bladed projectile sword with dagger and hilt, the sword of the sword and the sorcerer title here. Oh my gosh. When that, when he shot it, it was, it was like a sword arrow. I, 
I just nearly fell out of my chair. I didn't know you were allowed to do that in these films. <laughs> do we have an ask a 12 year old boy on this sword? No, we don't. I, I was, he, he wandered in while I was watching it and he, he asked, what is this? But I think he wandered in during one of the vaguely rapey scenes. So I, um, I actually was like, don't look. <laughs> there is a scene, which is one of these like classic scenes for this genre and also classic for Dungeons and Dragons campaigns in general, where the group of mercenaries show up at the tavern, basically say like, what's going on in town? Like, where's the action? And the bartender's like, I know a guy who wants to hire some mercenaries. <laughs> yeah, I forgot that 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 is a definitely very important genre trope. That's how he gets mixed up in this. Yeah, yeah. There's a brother and sister, Alana and Micah, and they're the children of Richard's advisor, and they're in the process of fomenting a rebellion against Cromwell, which is supposed to be secret, but everybody knows about it. <laughs> And they're basically found out and Micah is captured while Alana tries to run away. And she almost gets away, but then gets cornered by Cromwell's minions who are about to rape her. This is one of the vaguely. No, I don't think this is even vaguely. This is one of the rapey scenes. Yeah. (laughs) Talon shows up at the last minute and defeats them with a turkey leg. (laughs) (laughs) He can't be tempted with money. Basically... Alana agrees to sleep with Talon if he'll rescue Micah. I think it was a little more elaborate than just sleep with him. It was like, one night, whatever you want. <laughs> yes. Which, the mind reels of, of what this would mean in this universe. <laughs> I read one reviewer's uh, review of this movie where they said something like, um, she agrees to sweaty barbarian sex. <laughs> like, <laughs> Okay, that actually reminds me a little more of Game of Thrones, but okay, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Speaking of Game of Thrones, I want to jump ahead to the planned red wedding of this, (laughs) which is the day Cromwell is to marry Alana, crucify Talon at the wedding ceremony, and have his archers kill all the guests in one day, a la Game of Thrones, or Obviously, I should say Game of Thrones, a la this, because this came out way before even the books. I was really surprised by the crucifixion. That was something I wasn't expecting to see in this film. And apparently the actor who plays Talon when he agreed to do the sequel, which went direct to video sometime uh, like around 2012. He said, OK, I'll come back on the condition you don't crucify me again. <laughs> it was apparently a lot for him, too. Well, they had to shoot the crucifixion scene twice because they have, for ratings purposes, there's one version where he's bound to the cross and there's one version where he's nailed to the cross. I saw the nailed version. Yeah, that's what I saw. <laughs> and yeah, it's it's pretty graphic. That's something that we should say about this. This is a pretty graphic film in a lot of parts. The concubines free Talon's men. Also, the nobles wise up at about the same time and Talon like hulks out and pulls his hands out of the, Uh. the, the, uh, wooden pegs nailed into the, I don't think that's even physically possible unless you're superhumanly strong. It's just very strange, but all of this happens right at the same time. So there's this mass rise up between his men getting freed, the nobles turning against Cromwell and Talon escaping. So all of this brings us to the climax where we have another giant snake. Yes. Killing or porking Alana. I'm not sure which. (laughs) (laughs) It was ambiguous. Yeah. And I love the gratuitous fog in this dungeon set piece. Just like, I don't know where this fog came from, but it definitely added to the mood. (laughs) As we have Cromwell, Zusha, and Talon fighting a three-way duel to the death. The turducken (laughs) of fantasy battles, right? Uh, I felt like it was a pretty satisfying death for Cromwell, because I have to say throughout the film, I had it out for him. It reminded me of the Princess Bride in a very weird way. 
some of the dynamics between Alana and Cromwell felt very buttercup and humperdink in some ways about, you know, she's like, I'll never marry you kind of thing. And yep, you have this sort of rogue coming to rescue her. I mean, of course, it's very romantic in Princess Bride. And here it's like the undertones of like, I'm doing it because you said you'd sleep with me for one night kind of thing is a little different. Well, it's five years before Princess Bride. And I think what's going on here is like, it's an unintentional genre mashup. Like they know they want to do fantasy, but they got one foot in the sword and sorcery genre, which would have the raping, the pillaging, you know, that, and one foot in the romantic fairy tale. Like it wants to be like a once upon a time long ago kind of thing all in one. Well, I was going to ask you whether Princess Bride is in some ways lampooning this genre a little bit because like it's sort of in it and not but i was surprised to see how many parallels showed up just even in the plot of this film yeah i was very satisfied to see Cromo go down and kind of surprised that zusha was so easily defeated i i guess i you know i kind of expected him to like evaporate into fog and like disappear and be like i'll get you next time (laughs) or something like that the unsatisfying battle with the sorcerer at the end of these movies is something we're gonna be revisiting in future episodes here but probably almost my guess would be for budgetary reasons well richard mall like he had a bad reaction to the contact lenses that they put Mm. in uh for him and so like he had to be rushed to the hospital and then like a bunch of other scenes had to be shot without him and so like so there may be that reason also the expense of the sword itself i don't know but basically it's called the sword and the sorcerer but the sword itself the the, that wonderful three-bladed sword and the sorcerer zusha they're hardly in it they're in it like a little in the beginning yeah. and then they make an appearance again at the end but most of the movie has neither the sword nor the sorcerer in it yeah what we get i think is what i call the big sleep of sword and sorcery plots right the big sleep mm-hmm. is of course the bogart film which is considered a classic film noir but the plot is almost incomprehensible They sort of spoofed (laughs) it in The Big Lebowski, right? So this is kind of like that, where it's like just keeping all the characters straight and the plot lines. The only part of this where I thought like, oh, we lost a whole scene somewhere on the cutting room floor is it immediately goes from Talon's sidekicks plotting with the other concubine to them having been captured. And we get nothing about you know, them sneaking into the castle, like how it goes wrong, just like, you know, cut to commercial black and then we return and they've been captured. <laughs> and I was, I was like, oh, that's, <laughs> I want to know what happened. <laughs> I'd be surprised if they didn't say, all right, just, we don't have time for this. No time, no money. <laughs> yeah. Rip these three or four pages out. We're going to move on. There's definitely also a a, a hint of, and this may go to the your princess bride thing. There's a hint of um like harlequin romance cover modelage going on here. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah, the scene where she is being like oiled from head to toe was <laughs> was something that felt straight out of a bodice ripper. But both of the guys are like long-haired like, you know, um what what was that guy that was on all the covers in the 80s? Like what oh. was his name? Fabio? No. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it was. Maybe it was Fabio. Anyway, like (laughs) him and there were a couple of others. There were like two or three guys that were on the covers of all of these romances. And uh, yeah, they didn't give you that Fabio sort of vibe to parts. (laughs) Yeah. No, there's definitely part of this that felt like I couldn't tell sometimes who's fantasy they were playing into whether they're playing into the male fantasy of like i'm gonna rescue the damsel in distress this was something i found generally disappointing about this film relative to conan is we had such badass women characters in conan and then in this film they all kind of fall back on either a damsel in distress or like using sex for power (laughs) kind of character but not in a 
cool way the way the witch sorceress does in Conan more in a like very predictable way so I was a little disappointed by that but generally I actually found some of the woman is trapped and she's you know she's in jeopardy she's gonna have to be married off to a guy she doesn't love except there's this really hot scoundrel who's also going to try to save her like that feels very typical of the kind of romance novel that would be written written for women in mind but it's also clearly a male fantasy as well and there was swinging from chandelier type stuff going on and while i didn't have the quite as built as uh, Schwarzenegger and as well schooled in sword fighting, they made up for it in really doing Errol Flynn type jumping around and stuff like that acrobatics. Yeah, I would say actually, I was extremely surprised how well the effects and cinematography held up for this film because based on how low the budget was, I was sort of expecting it to feel really cheesy the entire time but they did a lot with red lighting and you know just like they created the mood in a way that was convincing and that surprised me a great deal what was your favorite effect i have a a note here that just says eaten alive by rats (laughs) so i i think just like some of the scenes like that were filmed in a convincing way i mean those were obviously real rats so (laughs) But yeah, the red the red lighting in the beginning, I felt really did a great job of setting the sword and sorcery mood. And it made Susha convincing in his getup. I didn't feel like I was necessarily watching someone wearing a rubber mask. There was a little bit more to it. I thought what they did with his character was good. I'd say the wall of faces was my favorite. They had a scene where there was an entire wall of human faces. Yeah. And at first you think that they're they're just like molds, you know, that the and then they start moving and talking and stuff. And and it, that was really well done, I thought. Do you have any favorite lines from the film? Yes, I pulled out two. One of them is um a really hilarious line that might have even been given to susha but it's uh i carry a message crucial to the final conflict (laughs) which (laughs) happens relatively early in the film so (laughs) i just like struck me as like just (laughs) so bald and out there um that one and and the ending line of course is classic there are kingdoms to save and women to love uh you know really tied the whole thing together so my favorite was there's this scene where R- very on toward the beginning, Zusha and Cromwell are defeating Richard's forces and someone who I guess is uh, Talon's brother or half brother or something comes, comes to the king, you know, and he's like stumbles in and he's bleeding and like dying. And he's like, <laughs> and Richard's like, bring a leech. <laughs> And then he says, father, and he's like, no, don't talk. Wait for the leech. (laughs) And it just reminds me so much. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but the old Saturday Night Live with um, with uh, Steve Martin as the barber. There's a guy comes in and he's been run over. I think it's Bill Murray comes in. He's been run over by the ox cart, you know, and he's like, (laughs) you know, he's bleeding and all that. And he says, Ah, what seems to be the matter with your friend here? I broke his legs. Hmm. I I was at the festival of the Vernal Equinox, and uh, I guess I had a little bit too much meat, and I darted out in front of an ox cart, and it all happened so fast that poor little fellas couldn't stop in time. Well, (laughs) you'll feel a lot better after a good bleeding. (laughs) But I'm bleeding already. (laughs) Say, who's the barber here? So yeah, that that kind of reminded me of that. So yeah. I, I got to give props to that line because someone threw that in and it just makes that scene. Wait for the leech. It's perfect. <laughs> All right. Um, I think that about wraps it up for the sword and the sorcerer part of our sword and sorcery exploration. We'll be back on the next date with an eight in it. Until next time, this is Eric. This is Johanna. Signing off.
Why do I feel like I'm missing something? Maybe it's just what we're dealing with. Okay, coffee. 